This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Thank you for joining us today for our program, The Brain on Drugs. I'm Stan Rhodes. When the famous fried egg public service announcement first came out in 1987, scientists at the time didn't have the equipment to non-surgically look inside of people's brains. They do now. New technology has enabled researchers to see exactly how the brain develops through time. And as a result, it has changed how we now look at things such as teen behavior, drug use, and drug prevention. Well, three experts are with me today on the program as we will talk about the brain on drugs. Let me introduce my guests. Dr. Timothy Condon is a neuroscientist and the deputy director of NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Dr. Amelia Aria is the director of the Center on Young Adult Health and Development at the University of Maryland School of Public Health and a senior scientist at the Treatment Research Institute, or TRI. And Ms. Senta Gowdy is the Chief of Prevention in the Florida Office of Drug Control in Tallahassee, Florida. Well, welcome everyone. I remember seeing that back in 1987, and it did have an impact on me. I thought it was a rather strong message, but is it accurate today? Well, it's not accurate today, but back in 1986, 87, when that was uh, popularized by our good friends at the Partnership for Drug-Free America. It was a metaphor and it was the state of the science. That's the way we had to depict your brain on drugs was an egg in a frying pan to kind of talk about and suggest the impact of, of drugs on the brain. But with the advance of neuroimaging technologies, PET, mm -hmm. MRI, um, we actually can see how drugs actually are right. working in the brain in real time now. W was that message aimed at adolescents, teens, adults? Who was it aimed at? I believe it was it was aimed at the general public. Uh, that's another uh, change that we've we've been able to grow in our understanding of how the brain works, and so we can target our messages now based on uh, what is developmentally appropriate. And so our messages don't have to be one size fits all, which is one of the changes mm -hmm. that uh, this new technology that Dr. Conan's talking about is so wonderful. So in 23, 24 years time, we we know more now of what's happening to the brain. A lot more. How about general brain development? What do we know that we didn't know? Well, <clears throat> you know, way back then, uh, in the 80s, doesn't seem it seems that, so far away. Doesn't yeah. seem that far away now. <laughs> um, but um, we actually only in the last five, uh, ten years have learned that the brain continues to develop um, long past when we thought it was finished, and so um, into the early 20s. So general brain development continues for a long period of time. And um, that's new information that we don't have all the answers about, but uh, really says that we have to think about these things differently. So how new is this research, this information that we have that has changed our thoughts about development? I think in the past five to 10 years, there's really been an explosion of new research and new technologies that new enable technologies us to sort of out. peek into the brain mm -hmm. and understand the relationship between the biology and the behavior. Okay, before we go any further, let's talk about in, in general terms about the brain itself. Uh, what areas make up the brain? Well, <clears throat> there are the older basic areas of the brain, the uh, midbrain, um, kind of uh, the what we call the vestigial areas of the brain. And, the, and here you see um, the areas like the hypothalamus and the pons and the medulla, uh, areas that are about basic body physiology, about heart mm -hmm. rate and breathing and about emotional types of things. And then there's the cerebral cortex on the top, um, which is a higher order. It's an area that develops last. It's an uh, area most developed in human beings and not so much in lower animals. And that's an area that uh, helps us with more of our thinking. So different parts do different things. Absolutely. So normally, how does the brain receive and, and process information? 
Well, the brain receives information from external stimuli, from our senses, uh, vision. Eyes, ears, Eyes, smell, ears, touch, yeah. smell, uh, auditory, yeah. And, um, and that information is processed in a whole variety of ways um, by these chemical messengers. Um, and it's processed through an uh, area, through a mechanism called neurotransmission, which is essentially how one brain cell communicates with the next brain cell. That's neurotransmission. So we've wrapped up exactly how the brain works in just a few minutes. Pretty much. There's a whole lot more to it than that, I'm sure. When is it that the brain is considered fully developed? Well, we know now, as uh, um, Amelia was mentioning, is that in really only in the last five to eight years, uh, because of the studies looking at adolescent brain development, a normal adolescent brain development using these new imaging technologies, that we it we know now that the brain is fully developed only um, in the early, to the early 20s now, before we thought it was much, much earlier. But we know all during the teens, the brain is still developing, and that the last area of the brain to develop are these uh, higher cortical areas. You know, we, we talk a lot about early development, which is a critical time for the human brain. And um, w there's a lot of uh, information about the developmental stages of early childhood. Mm -hmm. And w what ages are you talking about? I'm talking uh, zero to five. Mm -hmm. um, what we've learned now with the new technology is that uh, there are developmental stages. And so, you know, there's things that are happening developmentally, of course, when an infant begins to learn to just be able to pick up something, uh, all the way through now till uh, our mid-20s. And so different developmental stages occur along that path. And how our youth develop across that time, their experiences, their environment, their genetics, all those play, have a part to play in their developmental stages. So people are really familiar, parents especially, are familiar with those early developmental stages and how as your infant is growing, you mm -hmm. need to help support their development. What this new technology is giving us is uh, early information that will help uh, parents, teachers, anyone who's working uh, with youth understand that, that there are developmentally appropriate times for uh, education, for experiences, uh, and for uh, how they react with the youth in their lives. And that's a new message. It's a very new message, uh, and we're still developing it. There's still things that we don't know, but we do know definitely that there are developmental stages up through the 20s, and knowing that means that we have so much more uh, tools and valuable information uh, to help us help them grow and mature so that, that mm -hmm. they have successful and happy and healthy lives. Well, what happens to the brain during adolescence? Well, um, it uh, it continues to mature. It's growing physically and in size, and it's growing in size. It's growing in the connections. Uh, <coughs> the different areas of the brain are essentially connecting up, um, and that sounds kind of funny, but that's really what the brain maturation is all about. And, and this is normal. This is normal, and this is uh, and uh, you know it's not the same for everyone, and uh, every individual is not from zero to 22 years of age, but. In this picture, you can see that that blue represents, that dark blue is the maturation which occurs from the back of the brain, which are areas involved in our motor function, coordination, mm -hmm. uh, to the front of the brain and the sides where the areas, again, involved in um, uh, decision making and things like executive function. So um, it, it starts at the back of the brain and proceeds forward? Cerebellum motor function, very mm -hmm. fine coordination. You can watch that in your young children as they start to uh, be able to pick things up and to walk. Uh, motivation, um, that's a next area that kind of uh, develops. And then uh, emotional areas are very important and those are developing all along because we certainly mm -hmm. know that our young kids and our adolescents and our teenagers certainly have a, a healthy emotional life. <laughs> um, and then the last area is, again, uh, the area involved in things like judgment, mm -hmm. decision making. Things we could use a lot earlier come a little bit later. Absolutely. Wow. Well, and I think that a lot of parents don't realize that children um, aren't going to process the information the same way as they do. And they need to realize that if that's still immature, they have to help them become that 
frontal lobe and they have to understand and not get so angry and frustrated that their children aren't getting it. That's got to be a difficult message to get across because for eons we've been thinking that somebody who is 16, 17 years old or what have you is nothing more than a little adult and has all the same things that you should have at 30, 40, 50. Right, and it shouldn't really be interpreted to mean that you shouldn't give children responsibilities mm -hmm. that are sophisticated um, or that you should cut them a break if they're continually um, not understanding something or I think that you just need to understand that they may, may need more guidance in terms of um, understanding the consequences right. of their actions, things that are sort of controlled by that frontal area. Sure. Dr. Kind of what is gray matter? <clears throat> well, gray, maria, uh, gray matter is the, um, really the um, brain <laughs> tissue itself. And when um, uh, um, it's the neurons, the brain cells it themselves. It would appear in and color they, as they gray matter. Gray and, and when um, they fully develop, um, a lot of the areas are covered by, um, you see, white matter uh, because the white is something called myelin, myelin which is a, 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 a compound that actually increases the transmission or the speed at which these signals travel between brain cells. So, mm -hmm. so the, uh, the brain physically changes as we grow? Yes, it physically changes. It grows larger. And, and as I mentioned before, the connectivity changes so that um, the, uh, we, I think we have a picture here, as you can see the blue is the maturation of um, the, the cells. They're finally connecting up. And, and this would be what age, approximately? Well, again, it goes from, in this, in this video that mm -hmm. you're seeing, it, this is from zero to 22 years of age. Zero to 22. So it's a time lapsed over years. Um, um, very elaborate and very important research uh, published just about five or six years ago now. And I think what is very important to realize is that um, the connectivity that Dr. Condon is talking about enables the brain to focus more on important tasks rather than having a multitude of information being processed at the same time. The brain becomes better at focusing. Mm -hmm. So there's actual um, pruning of areas that aren't as important and you begin to be have that ability to focus better. Those areas that are pruned, what, what happens to them? Well, it, it's, think of it maybe, and I'm uh, more of a lay person mm -hmm. than uh, my, my friends with me, but think of it as sort of a rewiring uh, occurs. Um, the research that I've read indicates that it starts some for some people around 11 and 12, 10, 11, uh, and the brain begins this process of re rewiring itself. So in those early years, we hear, you know, you need to uh, provide them with all um, the stimulation and education so that all these uh, connections, the communication uh, pieces um, are, are um, put together to help that early brain uh, deal with its environment mm -hmm. that it's in. Uh, when uh, the brain gets to that stage, 10, 11, 12, uh, it begins the process of saying, I don't need that piece anymore. I need now to move ahead with getting ready uh, to um, be, be more mature. And so the... And this is a natural maturation process. It, it, it is very much a part of how we all got to where we are today. It is a natural part. It's, uh, the brain's very redundant early on and that this is this pruning it determines the specificity mm -hmm. of how these particular areas mm -hmm. of the brain um, and what their function is going to be and so that that is really kind of it in a nutshell so anyone who's ever raised a 10 or 12 year uh -huh. old you know they start behaving a little differently then and you're like oh my gosh what has happened to this <laughs> um, lovely like uh, overnight individual. It has changed. well really honestly you can you can almost uh, see it in how they are behaving and they don't none of us knew until a few years ago but they certainly aren't understanding what's happening to their to their brain of course uh, but it you can wa if you can watch it you can watch how right. their behavior changes and how they move fr uh, from one stage to a more emotional stage um, and and how we as adults then interact with them needs to understand that they have moved from this place 
to this place in their developmental stage. Uh, and just like when they're, they're smaller uh, and they're learning to walk and you have to be sure that you know, you've gotten all, uh, you've got all your sharp instruments out of the way, you, you keep them away from the hot all oven, the right. all of those things that you did when they were at that stage, there's a whole new set of them that you now need to be aware of. And I think right. that's what Amelia was referring to, is that um, they've got the walking part down now. <laughs> but now, you know, you, you have to remind them to look before they cross the street. And just saying it to them once is not going to work mm -hmm. because they're at an emotional place in their lives. And they're, they're in this, this world that's much different than the world that mm -hmm. we're in. And we and it's us changing. to be able to right. recognize that. Well, is it the same for boys and girls? I mean, is it? The same level, everything happens along the same? That's something that we're really um, very interested in and that we're looking this at. This is new? Yeah, we okay. look mainly at the um, behavior of boys and girls and the risk for um, engaging in drug taking by gender. Um, but we really haven't figured out completely um, how the brain development is contributing to those gender differences. It's a very well, interesting area. I'm curious to know about their ability to make emotional decisions. And is it rather impulsive at that age, uh, adolescence? Well, certainly. <laughs> Anyone who's had a, a children <laughs> and adolescent know that that's correct. And uh, these limbic areas of the brain uh, that are more involved in emotional um, aspects are, um, are, are acti activated by um, emotional memories or emotional reading or emotional faces. Whereas, uh, as you can see in this uh, slide, uh, an adult brain, the cortical areas showing the same emotional message uh, gets activated differently. So again, it... It's more that when you make a decision, not necessarily an emotional decision, mm -hmm. any decision is governed more by the emotional parts of the brain during that stage. During that stage. Mm -hmm. So rather than the cortical areas being responsible for that decision where you have more reasoning, you have the emotions driving the decision. So it's not necessarily an emotional decision that you have to make or, or a decision about a relationship or something emotional. It's a decision about anything where the emotions will play a bigger part in an adolescent than in an adult. Well, all you have to do, to do is look at popular media and look at how uh, emotional all those uh, current movies are that are aimed at mm -hmm. that population. Right, because we have the feeling that, that. Right, right, right. We have a feeling that most teenagers are, are risk takers. Well, it, it is part of the brain's development, and it is part of the natural maturation process um, that that it, they then uh, engage in more risky behavior. Uh, because uh, of the maturation process, because they move from an emotional place more than a thinking place where they have their critical thinking skills are not as fully developed uh, as ours are at our ages. So uh, they have to move from that place. That's the place that they are at. But, but parents and adults tend to think nowadays, because they're not up to date with the research that is coming out, want to say, why did you do that? Why did, you know, we've taught you better than that. We've given you the information. Why did you, why did you do that? And many times the response might be, I, I don't know. Right, it's because they're not able to evaluate. And I hate to generalize because there's a lot of individual sure. variability right. with a lot of children. And some kids are very good at judging mm -hmm. the effect of their own actions. And, and that's because seeing, the brain is growing at a different rate right, perhaps than someone and, else. And just foreseeing the consequences. Or maybe they've had an older brother or sister where something has happened right. and they've incorporated that into their own decision making. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about the brain, it's about how the brain is processing information from the environment as well. So in terms of a child, like you said, who you're saying, how did you make such a stupid decision? Mm -hmm. It's because they weren't able to judge the long-term um, consequences of that decision and they just never thought about it. They were sort of living in the day to day and not really thinking three steps down the line. So some parents think, well, wait a minute, I've told you once, I shouldn't have to tell you again. That doesn't hold true. Yeah, my mother used to say, a word to the wise is sufficient. And we have <laughs> to remember that we're not always um, as wise as our parents would want us to be at 
12 or 13 years old. You know, Stan, I think you put it uh, really well when you said that uh, thinking that a 16-year-old is just a small adult isn't really the correct way to look at it. And so if you think of as an adult, uh, and I'm sure this never happened to you, but <laughs> if you had a colleague sure. who uh, insulted you or offended you and you got angry, um, and then you think about your response before mm. you uh, initiate it, a younger person, mm -mm, no. it doesn't work that way. And that's because these connectivities, this decision-making process is weighing the costs and the uh, risks and the actual appropriate behavior or the appropriate response. And it's r literally making that kind of balancing uh, act. Um, and that develops later on. But I think it's important to understand that children aren't thinking of these consequences, but we can talk to them about the consequences and they can be educated about the consequences so the next time a decision is made, they have the benefit of our education or the voice in their head. And it may take more than said. once or yeah. twice or three right. times but to I, get I it don't, I don't want you to interpret this to mean that they're incapable of making good decisions. It's just that they need more help and more education mm -hmm. about well, what are those long-term consequences and some concrete examples mm -hmm. of what those consequences could be. Like, pointing out in the paper, reading a story and reading a story about a teenager who had too many kids in the car and got involved in an accident, that's a good example to bring up to your teenager and say, this is an example of how this person didn't